welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is the skeleton. So, we've already done a lot of the skeleton and bones and muscles of the day. So if you want to go back through all of that, you can just watch the first couple minutes of every lecture <laughs> up until now. Let's just quickly talk about the divisions of the skeleton. And, hold on, there are some cameraman issues, hang on. The issue is that there is no cameraman. I'm gonna have my master's for their degree of physiology, not videography, and things like lighting and angles. Anyway, uh, a couple things to be aware of. You have to be able to identify left from right on many of the bones. And you're gonna have to be able to do that from a picture from my living room or from wherever the lab assistant may take it. And so how are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna make mental notes of the bone markings that indicate sightedness. The lab assistant will probably help you do that later. Uh, okay, so I have a couple quick questions for you and then we'll talk about some skeleton that we haven't already discussed. All right, so the most important characteristic for designating a bone as a long bone is A, its total length, B, its elongated shape, C, its length relative to other bones, D, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is its elongated shape. It doesn't matter, its total length, because a lot of short bones are bigger than some of your little like long bones and your phalanges and things. Um, all right, so this is what matters. Okay, depressions on bones include A, tubercles, B, tuberosity, C, faucet, E, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is fossa, fossa. Tubercles and tuberosities are attachment points, uh, so they're projections off of bones, not depressions. Okay, a group of concentric rings of bone comprising the functional unit of compact bone is called a lamella, an osteon, lacunae, all of the above, A and B only. This time it's an osteon. And you might say, yeah, but a lamella is a ring of concentric bone. It's one. And if you get a bunch of those around a central canal, that's an osteon. And the big keywords to look at in this question are the functional unit of compact bone. So the osteon is the functional unit of compact bone, so that should have tipped you off. Okay, so skeleton. The axial skeleton is everything that is found on the long axis of the body. So the bones of the skull, the bones of the vertebral column, and the bones of the thoracic cage. So we've actually already met most of the axial skeleton in bones of the day. What we did not talk about was the skull. And so the skull actually has two parts. The cranium, or the cranial bones, and then the face that contains the facial bones. So your cranial bones are all bones that are touching your brain. So we've got cranial bones in the skull, and these touch your brain. You've got your frontal bone in the front. It's connected. What frontal? It's connected to the two bones right behind it, your parietal bones, um, by this thing called the coronal suture. So our joints in our skull, the joints between the bones in our skull are called sutures. So this is the frontal bone here. This is the coronal suture that we find in the coronal plane. And these are the two parietal bones that are attached to the frontal bone posteriorly. So for another cranial bone, or two more cranial bones, we've got right and left parietal bones. That's what we've got here, <laughs> believe it or not, and that line holding um, our frontal bone to those parietal bones, again, is the coronal suture. We'll talk more about joints next class. Um, the, so we can see our parietal bones right here. These are connected to each other by the sagittal suture. So this line right here would be the sagittal suture. This one right there is the coronal suture. Okay, then underneath each of our parietal bones, we have uh, temporal bones. Dang it all, I cannot get this skull back together. All right, well, oh, you know why? Frontal bone. 
coronal suture, left and right parietal bones, sagittal suture. In the back, we have the occipital bone here. And what's weird is that you might see on some of your figures is there can be these little bones hanging out around there. Those are called sutural bones, and those are different in everyone. The occipital bone is this bad boy right here with this big hole in it that your brainstem connects to your spinal cord through. So occipital bone, and then here we've got our temporal bones. The other facial, I'm sorry, the other cranial bones that we have are kind of hard to see. They're easier to see from this way, of course, now that I just got it put back together. The ethmoid bone here that we talked about when we were going over the special sense of smell and the sphenoid bone. So if your brain's sitting in here, all of those bones are touching it. Frontal bones, ethmoid bones, sphenoid bone, uh, temporal bones, occipital bone, parietal bones on top. Okay, so left and right parietal, right and left temporal, you've got one occipital in the back, and then kind of weird, but like down in your, going down like also like mixing and forming part of your nasal cavity and all that are the ethmoid and sphenoid bones, but they do also touch your brain. So those would be our last cranial bones, it's the ethmoid, and the sphenoid. So I'm going to have the lab assistant take you pretty much through most of your bone markings. So it'll just be easier for her to do than it will be for me to do in a lecture type fashion. But those are your cranial bones. Those are the major sutures. Um, squamous suture right here. So coronal, sagittal, squamous, lambdoid. All right. Now, your facial bones, I think this that everything you should Your facial bones, then, are what we find here in the front. So you've got figures in your book that show all of these things, and I'm just not copyright infringing those figures. So I think that this figure in your book is the skull going like this. So the coronal suture would be right here. Oh, that's totally it. Here's the squamous suture here. Here are your facial bones here. Got a mandible on the floor. Okay, so whoa, I got everything backwards today. Wah, wah, wah. These are the facial bones up here, maybe the face. Uh, lambdoid suture you can see back here. So I am 100% positive you've got a picture in your book and you can look at it. What? Okay, temporal bones a little weird. I don't think I brought any individual temporal bones which is too bad. But the temporal bone is protecting your delicate uh, ear. So remember when we looked and we had the vestibule and the cochlea and they were surrounded in a bony labyrinth? All of that is hiding here. So if we were to pull out this temporal bone and have it be all alone, then we could see some distinct parts of it. So the squamous part is the part that's by that squamous suture. So that's nice, squamous part up there. Uh, the zygomatic process of the temporal bone is right here. So your temporal bone is a cranial bone and it's got a zygomatic process. That is one part of the zygomatic arch. This makes your cheekbone the zygomatic arch. The other part of the zygomatic arch comes from the temporal process of the zygomatic bone, which is a facial bone. We're not there yet. We're talking about the specifics of this cranial bone, the temporal bone. So it's got a zygomatic process. This is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. This is the squamous part of the temporal bone. This is the petrous part. And it kind of looks petrified. I don't know. Looks, I don't know, I just, that's what I, how I remember it. Sticking off of it is the mastoid, off of the petrous part is the mastoid process. So sternocleidomastoid attaches to the mastoid process and when you contract it, it pulls your head. Okay, all right, awesome, what else? Styloid process. Styloid processes look like styluses. That's the styloid process. The tympanic part, is right there, the tympanic part. So that's your external acoustic meatus. This is also the tympanic part. And coming through there is your internal acoustic meatus. And those are the things that you have to be able to identify for the temporal bone. 
Okay, sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is weird, but also really cool. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Mothman Prophecies, but the sphenoid bone looks like the Mothman to me. So lesser wings, greater wings. This thing right here is where your pituitary sits. It's called the cella tersica. I thought it was the sea of the soul. Ooh, optic nerves go through there. And where do they come out? Ooh, in there. So you see them? Ooh, optic canals. Ooh, optic canal. Superior orbital fissures, inferior orbital fissures. Oh yeah, the assistant's gonna tell you all that stuff. Sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone. I actually have individual sphenoids and ethmoids because they're such cool bones, all on their own. And really, sometimes it's the best way to see all this stuff. So here's a sphenoid. Look, Mothman prophecy, right? So these holes right here are the optic canals where your optic nerves come through. This is the uh, cella tersica where your pituitary sits. Our lesser wings, our greater wings down here. So this is how it sits in back there behind your frontal bone. And then this is your ethmoid bone. I wish you could touch this because this Christigalli or coxcomb is like this sharp protrusion that sticks up here. And then here you can see, um, can you see it? On the skull. And here they try and do a good job of showing you the cribriform plate. But you see here, this is the Christigalli or the coxcomb, and on each side you have these little holes. That's the cribriform plate, which stands for moth eaten, and that's where your olfactory epithelium stretches up through. So, okay, my roommate's driving up. I'm not happy about it. Okay, anyway, cribriform plate, Freemana, what else can we see? Oh, so. These things are your nasal concha, and this is what helps to create the turbulence as you breathe in. So if you look in here, your nasal cavity um, has a couple different things we can see. This is called the perpendicular uh, plate of the ethmoid bone sticking down here, and it's meeting with another facial bone called the vomer. Those two come together to form your nasal septum. And these things in here are our nasal concha, and they create turbulency on, on the air as you breathe it in, so it humidifies our air, warms it, moistens it, all of that. Um, as we're coming through. So you can see we've got a superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha, and that's coming from our uh, middle nasal concha is right here. Let's look here. And we can also see our um, perpendicular plate. So, oh, this one's better all the way around. So there's the cribriform plate. Here's the Christigalli. Here is the perpendicular plate, and there's the middle nasal concha. Okay. Okay, in addition to cranial bones in your skull, you also have facial bones, and these make up your face. Huh, imagine that. So let's look at our facial bones. If we look here, these two up here, these two little ones right here are your nasal bones. The next thing that's coming up here is actually part of your maxilla. So these are your maxilla, one maxilla, maxillae, mandible, and so your maxilla actually extends up and comes next. And then we have our lacrimal bone, which is the lacrimal bone. <laughs> Here is that zygomatic bone I was telling you about. And down in here, we have the vomer. You can't, it's kind of hard to see, but that's also considered a facial bone. And, okay, maxilla, what else? Mandible, okay, palatine bones, back here. And this is the palatine process of the maxilla. And then this is the mandible, not paired, okay? Mandible, maxilla. Palatine process of the maxilla, palatine bones, those two together make up the hard palate. Your nasal septum is made by the vomer and the perpendicular plate of your ethmoid bone. What else do we have in this face? Those are the facial bones. Oh, that's horrible. I'm like, not even a ventral disc. It could just come out. Those are the facial bones. Thank you for being here with us today. Cool. Hyoid bone. Hyoid bone is a little weird. If you were to walk up to the lab capsule in your living room, 
Sitting there. If I were to ask you what is it? That's a hyoid bone. This is the only bone that doesn't articulate with any other bone in your body directly. It sits here uh, in the anterior aspect of your throat. It protects your um, trachea here. So that's the hyoid bone there. Okay, so that was the skull and the hyoid bone. Okay, this skull bone is connected to the rest posteriorly by the coronal suture. It is the blank bone. Oh, the right, it's the front of the bone. Great job. Okay, next question. Which of the following bones does not articulate directly with any other bone of the skeleton? A, the mandible, B, the clavicle, C, the hyoid, D, all of the above. Oh, yeah, C, the hyoid. Okay, this is really a next column. We already did. It's the bone of the day. So go back and watch it. Look it over in your book. Oh, the thoracic cage. We already did it. It's the bone of the day. So go back and watch it. Look it over in your book. Okay. This group of vertebrae articulate with the ribs. A, thoracic. B, lumbar. C, cervical. D, all of the above. E, A and B only. Oh, yeah. You're right. It's A, thoracic. So if you recall, thoracic vertebrae have those articulating facets on their transverse processes and on their bodies because they articulate with the ribs. Okay, so the appendicular skeleton, before we get there, I have a quick question for you. How do skeletons reproduce? They both. Okay, the appendicular skeleton, pectoral girdle. Oh, we learned it as a bone of the day. Clavicle, scapula. That attaches your upper limb to your axial skeleton, which has your humerus, your radius, your ulna, your carpals, your metacarpals, and your phalanges. They were bones of the day, too. Okay, the arrangement of the bones and muscles of the pectoral girdle is such that there is a high degree of blank, but a low level of blank. I'm going to let you read it. Symphysis. So I wish I had brought a female pelvis on because I think that everyone that I have is male. And one of the ways that I can tell that is because of how far that coccyx pokes into this region here. So this is the pelvic inlet and the pelvic outlet. And in females, the coccyx will often be broken off, but it definitely sits back a lot farther. And you'll see that the pelvic outlet in, fe in a female pelvis is huge. And why? Because we've got to pass baby's heads out. Why is this significant? Well, because if you look at a pelvis, let's say you came across a skeleton in your weekly forensic you know, searches, and you found a pelvis and needed to identify whether it was male or female. So you could tell by looking at the angle of that coccyx and by looking at the shape um, of, of the pelvic inlet and outlet. I've heard that male pelvises tend to look more like hearts and female pelvises tend to look more like apples. So I can almost guarantee you that I will find a picture or an image or a model of a female pelvis to test you on just because I just told you I would. And because I'm mad at myself that I didn't bring one home. Yeah, they're all males. Ugh. Even Kelly was supposed to be agender. Kelly's gender neutral with a male pelvis over there. Um, I, I see your dilemma. Lower limb, we met. It's bones of the day. The femur, I don't know why my camera's not focusing. You can do it. 
The femur is the bone of your thigh, and the tibia and fibula are the bones of your leg, and they, then we have the um, tarsals, metatarsals, and digits, phalanges. Okay, so this bone of the leg bears no weight. A, the femur, B, the tibia, C, the fibula, D, none of the above. Yeah, C, the fibula. So A doesn't work because this is one of the um, most weight-bearing bones of your body. But this is also not in your leg. It's in your thigh. The tibia and the fibula are in your leg, and the fibula does not bear weight. So as you see, the weight from the femur is dispersed onto the tibia, and then the tibia disperses the weight onto your talus, which if you recall, you have to know talus and calcaneus specifically uh, as tarsals. So the fibula is not actually bearing any weight, it just helps with uh, movement that we'll see next chapter. Okay. Aha, -ha, that's it. So I'm gonna let the lab assistant take you through each of these bones specifically with all the markings you need to know. And she might actually be nicer than me and go over the ones that we have already gone over for bones of the day, which would be a flip of characteristics, right? or of personalities. I don't know, maybe you never can tell which one of us is which. See you next time. So if we were to pull off this temporal bone and have it just be alone. Okay.